Well, welcome back once again to Talking With Tech. My name is Lucas Stuber, joined today by my friend Rachel Madel down in LA. How are you? I'm so good. How are you? I'm good. And I'm uh, excited to be joined also by Chris Begay, of course. How are you, sir? Fantastic. Happy to be here. So we were thinking that for today, we actually wanted to have um, more of a conversation uh, with everyone about the, the concept of core words, it's something that comes up a lot uh, in AAC practice, right? Um, if you haven't heard that phrase before, you might be listening to the wrong podcast. It comes up so much. Um, <laughs> but we, we want to kind of start um, start at the beginning, talk about what the definition is, uh, you know, the value of core words in implementation, and then also some specific tips of how to do that, how to integrate that uh, throughout the school day um, or the, the day of a student. Um, I want to kick it off with you, though, Chris. You're, uh, you had a lot of thoughts about this originally. So, so what are core words? Yeah, so I'm sure the three of us and uh, many listeners out there are trying to figure out ways to tell other people about it. We have to teach people what core words are. So when I do that, um, the way I start off, and I'm curious to hear what everyone else does, uh, I actually talk about how it's a statistical phenomenon. How if you were to go and record any conversation happening right now and start ticking off the words, you'd find that the majority of the words spoken are come from the same set of three. 300 to 350 words, roughly. So about 80% of what we say are the same 300 to 350 words. And therefore, when you only have so much time, like you only, you only have a limited amount of time to work with students, which words should we focus on? Well, let's focus on these 300 to 350 words because it gives you the biggest bang for your buck. But how else do you explain it? So I actually just made a video about this because I found I was explaining it all the time and I really wanted to use some visuals. So there's a video on my YouTube channel and it goes through very, it's very visual. So, you know, it goes through the difference between core words and fringe words. Um, I think I use an example of going to the zoo. And if you're going to the zoo, you know, instead of saying elephant, you might say the word C. Um, instead of saying ice cream, you might say the word eat. Um, so it kind of shows you the difference between core words and fringe words, and it's a very really, it's very visual. Um, and I think the examples really help because we say these things, and it's like, oh, you know, but what is a core word, and is this a core word, or is that a core word? So I think it's it's important to um, kind of make it applicable to people so they can really wrap their heads around it. Right, right. So the concrete examples give some give some actual words. So since we're in a decidedly uh, non visual medium right now, let's uh, let's let's discuss them a little bit. So you said this other crazy term. What what is what are fringe words? So fringe words are the specific words. So elephant, for example, is very the, they're mostly nouns, and you know they're incredibly uh, specific. So core words are very general usually. Um, and they can be used in a variety of situations, which is why we love them as speech therapists so much is because you can use them all the time in a variety of different routines and with a variety of different materials and toys. So um, that's core words. And then fringe words on the opposite end is just very specific. Um, I think there's always the example I feel like in, um, when people give presentations, when I give presentations, um, when you're at uh, and uh, during an art activity. Um, so you, instead of saying, you know, I need the scissors and I need the glue and all these kind of vocabulary terms that we use in a specific activity, we can use the word go, or we can use the word want, or we can use the word different. Um, so that's just a, a very, um, concrete example of a difference between core and fringe in a very specific activity. Great. You know, when I'm, when I'm talking about fringe, the way I like to represent it is, again, with the numbers. So mm -hmm. if you think like the average person has, let's say, 15,000 words, let's just say that, right? So that, and if what we, the majority of what we say is made up of these 300 to 350 words, then fringe vocabulary is everything else. <laughs> it's Literally. all the other thousands of words that it might be. And I also think it helps put, put people in context. So uh, Lucas, Rachel, what I'm gonna do right now is a little magic, okay? Uh, some audio magic. I'm gonna take a yo-yo and picture that in your mind. I'm moving it back and forth, right? I'm hypnotizing you right now. Think, go back to when you were in sixth grade. Remember you were in sixth grade, you sat there. I'm feeling very sleepy. <laughs> that teacher was so nasty to you, remember? But she taught you what the parts of speech were. And so when you think about the parts of speech and you go back and you picture that sixth grade teacher teaching you about the parts of speech, what, what, what are they? Well, there's the action words, action words, which are called 
Verbs. Verbs. Verbs, <laughs> right? And we have. This is a uh, test. This is a test. <laughs> this is a test. Uh, there's, uh, what else? We got nouns. verbs. Nouns. We've got those Prepositions. Describing. Prepositions. What else do we have? <laughs> Uh, pronouns. Almost, <laughs> pronouns, right? Almost every... Lucas, you're losing. You're losing this game. <laughs> like, so you're winning. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And to, uh, so we have all these parts of speech and the most of the core vocabulary make up most of those parts of speech. The one that is left out, the fringe vocabulary is... Nouns. The nouns, right? I often talk about those. The, the, uh, the, a lot of people will slap me for this, but... I call them the bad guys. They're the, the Mr. Yuck sticker of, um, because they are so often taught and so often not, not necessarily needed, you know? Yeah, right. Um, that's not to say there aren't times when we need to teach them. And I know we'll get to that later, but just in general, that those are the 20%. So if we're going to spend time and you only have a limited amount of time, maybe you spend your time on the 80%, on the, on the prepositions the pronouns the pronouns make they're almost in every sentence we say you know um so how we got to spend time on those yep. so something that i usually do when i'm trying to teach a family or a team about core words i uh show them a community one of my communication boards and i tell them i i show them i said if you or i weren't able to talk we could use this board very easily to, you know, get our, our needs met, to comment, to ask questions, um, you know, but, and then I, I pull up the, you know, some fringe vocabulary, so fringe folders, and I'm like, how far could you get if you were in the food folder, <laughs> you know, or how far could you get if you were just in people? Um, so it's just, it's the glue, the core words are the glue that helps build sentences. And you know, I think it's easy to just get really caught up in the specifics of this child likes this toy or this child likes this food. Um, you know, we have to teach them exactly where it is. You know, it doesn't have to be that complicated. We can say eat. Well, one, one thing I think it's important to, to note, too, is that this is not a unique struggle to, to AAC, right? So the concept of, of core words and core vocabulary has been used in, like, sight reading instruction, for example, for ages. And a lot of what um, I still see out there, despite all the research, for example, is things that have been informed by, like, the Edmark level one reading words for any teachers that are out there. So, I mean, this stuff goes back, you know, 70 years now. And it's one of the reasons why even if you take classes in Rosetta Stone, for example, they're going to try to teach you as an adult the word horse. Uh, because horse was considered to be a very important noun concept for kids 70 years ago. And it's lost a little bit of its salience, uh, right? Like I, I, I tried to do Rosetta Stone to learn German and I can still say fared to this day. That's the word for horse. It has never availed me anything, right? Um, so in, in looking to solve this problem of like, I mean, when I say problem, I mean, I guess, I guess what is the problem, right? What, what's what's the, the challenge? Like why is it important to identify these core words? Well, I think the biggest, the most important thing is that's how you build sentences. So you can only get so far with nouns. So it's just, and then I feel like it's like, okay, we had, they, you know, this child has tons of nouns. Look at their vocabulary. It's so great, but they're not able to make sentences. So right. it's like, and that's, and, and then it's like, oh, well, let's start incorporating some of these words that can help some of these verbs, you know, that can help start building sentences. And it's just like, you know, if we had started introducing them to core words two years ago, think about they could be building sentences by now. Um, so that's one of the biggest things as far as I'm concerned. Right. Yeah, you know, Rachel, a perfect example I use there is, um, you know, it's called AAC. And so it's the C is for communication. And when you have all those nouns there, a kid could take his finger and point to that goldfish cracker and he's communicating. I almost wonder if we shouldn't be calling it AAL, you know, a, a alternative or a, a, um, a augmentative language because that frames it in a different way is that yeah these are all words but what do we do with them we have to communicate in some way and put them together uh, syntactically and semantically mm -hmm. that, I, i've had that exact same thought that's great i love that so thinking about the um you know I, and I, so I'm going to refer to a resource here, and I encourage you to, uh, to go and look. We just had Jane Odom on the show from PRC. On the Language Lab, PRC has a, a good list of, um, of their core words that they integrate into the, the Unity system or the BinSpeak system. Um, there's a lot of history there that we won't go into in terms of PRC, but suffice to say that um, some of their researchers, like Gail Van Tatenhove, or some of the people that came up with um, a lot of the stuff we use today in terms of core words uh, back in the 70s through today. Um, but when I look at these, 
you know, one of the questions that I, I always ask people at conferences, for example, is I'll ask the audience to come up with the 10 words that they, if they could choose 10 words, what would they be to say for the rest of their life? <laughs> and um, inevitably, what I find is that I get really noun heavy lists, actually, um, which is funny. And I, I had somebody come up to me actually once and gave me verbs only. And it, I was like, it blew my mind. I was like, yes, like, because that's, that's, that's the abstraction, right? So when we're talking about building, um, building sentences, like what would happen if that student didn't have goldfish on their device, right? What would they go to? Yeah. They would use whatever is there. Yeah. Right? So what do you want to put there? <laughs> the other thing that I always think about too is I don't want a child to have to navigate through three or four levels of vocabulary folders to get to what they need to say. Think about that for one word. So then, if, and, and if we expect, you know, a child to be putting lots of words together, think about how long that is. It's just so easy, especially with all of the, you know, systems supporting the core word approach. Um, it's just stay on the homepage. We don't need to be doing all this navigating and it, fatiguing our clients. It just communication, whenever it becomes hard, kids don't want to do it. And the easier you can make it, the more likely they'll be to communicate with us. So, uh, hey, folks, this is Lucas Stuber. I, uh, I just want to take a real quick break here for something that's very important to me. Um, so normally around this time, we would be uh, advertising Audible or fresh food delivery or something. But uh, hey, exciting news. We've actually started to get attention from some uh, some big advertisers uh, that are actually aligned with our values. So um, that's great. Now, that's not happening this week, uh, maybe next week. But um, I did want to take a moment here uh, to share some information about some people that are doing really good work. And, and yes, full disclosure, I'm, I'm helping them out. Um, anyway, the, the problem of getting truly high-skilled AAC clinicians into rural and underserved areas has been a really big one that I've seen everywhere from internationally to Oregon to New Mexico to Alaska and everywhere in between. Um, well, there's a new startup company called AAC Live Now, uh, founded by you know, two guys who have experienced exactly this problem. Um, they built a really incredible video scheduling, billing, bells and whistles, one-stop shop uh, that's aimed not towards performing telepractice in AAC, but rather catering to what we know works best in research, which is consulting with families, advising school teams, giving training and support to the, uh, you know, the devices, um, device user circle of support. So listen, we already have a ton of states in line to allow us to start doing this, um, whether or not you're licensed in the state, and there's more coming. Uh, and it's, it's a huge deal for parents who maybe haven't had a clinician anywhere near them, or at least one that you know, doesn't know much about AAC. Um, so if you're a clinician interested in expanding your practice or helping out, even if you only have a few free hours a month, even just giving advice, or if you're a family in need of help who, who wouldn't mind uh, reaching some of the absolute top AAC specialists in the country, please, please, please reach out. Um, if you have any questions or interest, email me at lucas at speechscience.org. That's L-U-C-A-S at speechscience.org, all one word. And I feel strongly enough about the need for this that I will also give you my personal cell, which I've never done, um, which is 541-952-1029. Um, again, 541-952-1029. If I don't pick up right away, um, I'll call back. This is not a, a contract employment position. This is not something that you need to do at the stake of anything else. This is just another tool that you can add to your toolkit to reach these, um, you know, individuals with special needs uh, nationwide. Um, so. Please sign up, whether uh, as a clinician or as a client. There's uh, free consultations and all that stuff. So listen, I, I hate interrupting our show, um, especially a great show like this. Uh, but if there's something that I absolutely cannot abide, it's the knowledge that there are families out there suffering just because we either aren't aware of each other or we aren't close enough to help. So again, www.aaclivenow.com. You can reach me at lucas at speechscience.org or again, 541-952-1029. And uh, now, welcome back to the show. Hey, 
Hey, can I jump back to something for a second? Lucas, I really liked how you were talking about this activity that you asked people to do. Are there any other activities you or Rachel that you use to um, help people understand core words? Like one that comes to mind for me is bringing out a core board, right? Picture it, the uh, prolo quo or lamp, a screenshot from the home, uh, Lamp Words for Life, just a screenshot of it and saying, all right, everybody, you've got 10 minutes or maybe eight maybe five. You've got five minutes to write down as many different sentences as you can using only these words. And oh, I like that. It's like of, boggle, core word boggle. Yeah. <laughs> that really shows, I think, a lot of people how versatile they are, right? And, and how much you can say just with two words, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So, and it shows that it just this limited set, you can really say so much. Do you have any other uh, activities that you'd like to put people through or that uh, other people who are listening today might be going, hmm, I could do that with my, my teachers that I work with? Well, one that I, I love to use to, um, I, I was going to say punish grad students, but really it's very informative. And Rachel, you alluded to this idea a little bit, but um, I, I really like having students take systems out to like a Starbucks, for example, and then try mm -hmm. to use them functionally, um, which goes all the way back actually to grad school. I had a, a wonderful fluency instructor who had me do that uh, to pretend to be disfluent, right? And it was it was harrowing, you know? And so I've, I've translated that to the AAC world. And it's something I've also done uh, in my time as a, as a developer is take my own stuff out and try to use it and then you realize right away like oh wow that's a glaring omission that I didn't uh, recognize when I was sitting there programming it which is what happens right I mean often these you know an iPad will get taken back to a speech room for 30 minutes of programming or whatever and you throw a bunch of stuff on there based on what the goals that you see are and the input from the teacher but you know it, it's not always considered functionally you know whereas you know maybe the IAs in that classroom or somebody probably would have a really clear idea of how it's going to be used functionally um, what other yeah. activities that's, these are great uh, one that I've used in the past, um, I got to present to a high school English class. They were reading um, the the book with the fish on it. I feel I don't have to I have to edit in with the name of it, but there's it's a book about a student with a disability that uses a communication device, and they were doing that as an English class. So they invited me in to talk about communication devices, and so I did something very similar. I said, "Okay, you've got uh, here's a here's a chart. It's just a table that I printed out from Word, and I said, um, you know, maybe there was 25 spots on it. And I said, you get 25 words." What are you going to write? Because uh, you're going out to dinner now. And, and oh my gosh, every kid was like, uh, I need to write um, Kung Pao chicken and I need to write uh, biscuits and gravy, you know? And so they're filling this all in. And then we do the activity like, all right, let's have a conversation. I'm going to be the waiter. Let's sit here together. You sit here. And how about we're on a date? How about you and you two sit here together and I'll be your waiter. And now you try and use those words. And it's immediately glaring like, I can't say anything with all these nouns, you know? Yep. Exactly. That's perfect. That's why you remind just reminds me anecdotally of a fundraiser I went to where there was a silent dinner where everyone was handed like a random AAC device and required to communicate with their waiter uh, in that That's fashion. And you don't you don't find uh, I need more pepper. Or this is overdone and these other things on there. Really, um, that was a real dinner. Uh, it was a fundraiser. So wow, uh, that's interesting. <laughs> yes, yes. I'd love to. I want to do that one again. Yeah. Um, so looking again at the uh, the core words, so I guess we, what we've defined them as is, you know, again, often drawing from these top 350 words, uh, you know, that are used. These are the sort of bricks that we put together for the most of the rest of language. And oftentimes, um, you know, again, looking at the, the resources from the Pernicky Romich company, like we have, we have adjectives, we have prepositions, uh, which is, which is great for, um, great for a, a, an expansion of language standpoint, but, but prepositions and adjectives, like a lot of people tend to think of that as uh, sort of secondary. Why would they think that? Is that true? Well, I think that, I mean, I guess this leads into a discussion about where do we start and kind of the progression, right? Because it's not just, oh, we just give kids a bunch of words all at once. Um, you know, it's, from a teaching standpoint, it's like, okay, like, where do we begin? And I think that that's where the research is really great because it, you know, shows us the top, you know, frequently used words and we can use that to guide our, our practice. Um, I personally, it, it depends on the child as with everything. Um, some kids, it's like they totally get it. And I can just like dive right in with a lot of these core words and start modeling on their device. And they're like, yeah, like I can do this. I can build sentences. They just are fantastic. Other kids, they have a really hard time with abstract language concepts. So core words are going to be a little more difficult for them because they're not you know, understanding that abstraction yet. So that's where a situation where fringe might be more beneficial because 
you know, you see a picture of the iPad and then you touch it and then it, you get the iPad or whatever it is that, you know, the child's really motivated by. And that's really nice because the number one thing that I need when a child is introduced to their system for the first time is buy-in. And if they can like really like quickly get what they want and they can keep saying it over and over again and I keep giving it to them, all of a sudden it's like this device is this amazing magical tool that gets me whatever I want so fast. Um, So that's why I think that's a case to start with Fringe, um, but I'm just always an advocate of introducing core from the very start um, because kids, a lot, a lot of times kids who are having a hard time with abstract language concepts, they need exposure. They need to have constant exposure and a long, a, a, sometimes a long amount of time to really start understanding it. Um, so we need to start it right away. Yeah. You know, I think there's this myth that there's core versus fringe as opposed to doing them both. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, just to make that in a practical scenario is just yesterday, there was a focus session where I was sitting with a student and a, a a teaching assistant that I was coaching through and we were working on open and close. He had these grapes, you know, as a snack time activity and uh, we taught him open right in this very structured setting. But, and that was very, open is a core vocabulary word in case you didn't know. But then later on, uh, that was over and we were going down for library time. Like, so let's march down for library time. We sit down in the chairs and the librarian had designed this activity where she was showing clips of the Olympics. And so all I did sit, I sat next to the student and when uh, someone would jump up in the air, I mean, like he did it, you know, um, like, and, and maybe find some fringe that went along with it. But I, the, my point is I was modeling without the expectation that the student was actually going to do anything with that. Right. Because mm-hmm. that's the whole point of when little babies are born. We don't like, we don't have this expectation. They're going to talk back to us and we still model to them all the time. So let's just model to the kid in that situation. You know, it doesn't have to be trying to get something out of the kid uh, for 95% of their time. It can just be modeling sometimes. Yep. Well, I mean, this goes back to the the facts that we know, right, about how much how much input these these students have that's comprehensible in a form that they can reproduce, right? So they probably have all this oral language exposure, but they don't see AAC use anywhere near as much as you know they see people you know squirting air through their mouths uh, to be to be crass about it. Um, <laughs> but I, I love doing that sort of thing. And Rachel, you you mentioned a video that you have up earlier. So if it, folks, if you go to the uh, if you have a Roku, for example, you can install the Speech Science app and see all of our, our videos, or go to our YouTube channel. Rachel will be uh, uh, be on there. But there's also a video I have um, probably under clinical videos of just, I think it's me sitting with a student just watching a movie for about half an hour. And I'm just there with the device sitting there saying, that was big. That was fast. Wow, that was awesome. He did it. <laughs> like, he finished first. Like, just just, just showing, uh, you know, the possibilities. And, and part of that is about getting into more than just requesting, right? And obviously, we need to um, have that cause and effect relationship when we're starting out using a device. Like, Rachel, you said, you know, to, to get buy-in from the students and to make it something that, you know, they really um, are motivated by. But uh, there's a lot of commenting um, sort of stuff that you can do that has a really big social reward for the kids um, that you can do with core, you know. Can, yeah. can I bring up a, a thing about core too? Uh, this yes, this is um, what makes it a little bit difficult for people to wrap their brains around is that it's uh, the pictures, right? Core vocabulary words typically do not are not what uh, are called picture producers. They don't produce a picture in your mind, right? A quick activity I, I ask people to do sometimes is to uh, draw a picture of a of a truck, right? You draw a picture of a truck and then, hey, Rachel, look at this. What is it? And she would say, no matter how bad an artist I am, she'd say, yeah. it's a truck, truck. right? And then I say, okay, same thing, Rachel, get out of the room, draw another um, uh, Lucas. Okay, you're going to draw me a the, uh, the word job and suddenly it's like, what, how do I draw the word job? You know, how do I draw the word work? You know, what does that look like on a piece of paper when I try and draw it? And no matter what you drew, Rachel would come back in and she would try and label it with some sort of noun. She'd be like, um, desk, uh, office, uh, paperwork, uh, hammer, you know, what, what did you draw? Whatever you drew, it would be some sort of noun because core vocabulary doesn't necessarily produce this picture in your mind. So that makes it a little bit more difficult to teach, but that doesn't make it impossible to teach. There's, you still teach it just like you teach, like you, back to what you were saying, Lucas, how teachers teach sight words, you know? There's all sorts of techniques for teaching uh, language. 
Right. And I've been intrigued too to see some devices start to incorporate things like animated GIFs, for example, as the icons to try to scaffold that a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that would work with every student. I, I don't have enough data to comment, really. Um, I wonder if that would be distracting or, or not for, for certain individuals. But, um, well, so, so what are the, um, I mean, what are some of the strategies? I mean, I, there's some things that we know, right? So from research, we know that the frequency and intensity of exposure to these words in a meaningful context is the biggest predictor of acquisition. Um, so how do we do that? Is it just 30 minutes a week with an SLP? Well, yeah, that does it, right, Rachel? I mean, yeah, that should be think, totally fine. Maybe 25, let's cut it back, 15. Uh, <laughs> budgets, yeah. budgets are tough, yeah. That's true. <laughs> well, the nice thing is that, you know, you don't have to, the nice thing about core is they can be used across every activity. So it, it feels like, and I always think about, you know, because a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, the schools that I work with, they're really interested in the fringe words, right? Because I think it makes sense to people and they're like, okay, it's easy. Like we're talking about dinosaurs so we can make a dinosaurs folder. And I'm like, okay, great. Um, and that there's a place for that, right? And I think if kids are really motivated by dinosaurs, like great. They want to say stegosaurus and T-Rex, great. But the nice thing about core is that you can use it across multiple you know, lesson plans and activities, and it's so it's so easy to generalize, um, and that's something that I think I try to impress upon staff is that look, this is actually easier. It feels like oh, I don't know what to do. There's so many options, but it's really just start doing it, and you'll see it's really not. It's it's great because you can use the word go all day long, and it doesn't have to be okay. Where where is the dinosaur folder? <laughs> You know, it's right on the, if, if it's one of my devices that I've set up, um, it's, it's on the homepage. You can just stay on the homepage. Here's a practical strategy, all right, speech therapist, I'm talking to you, right? <laughs> Instead of spending your time focusing on um, the student for the next session, think about spending your time working with the communication partners doing this specific activity. Make a table in Word or Google Docs or whatever. At the top of the table, put the core words you want to focus on. And when I say core words, I usually mean like one or two. So uh, if you're going to teach in, you might as well also teach out. out right if you're going to teach up you might as well teach down hey. exactly, pairs. exactly. Like binary pairs. so you put those up there at the top of the and then you say all right everybody in the room uh the kids are walking off the bus how are we going to teach uh how are we going to teach in and out when they get off the bus and they fill in this chart right so the the first column in the chart in the table is the time of day and the sex second column in the chart is uh exactly how you're going to prompt them or how you're going to model in and out and the third column will be ticks how many opportunities can we do in this block of time where they get to exposure to in and out? And then after we get off the bus, now we're walking down the hallway. And then after the hallway, we're in hanging up our backpack. And now after hanging up our backpack, okay, it's time to go in for circle time. And you just go through your whole day like that thinking, all right, how are we going to do in and out? How are we going to do in and out? How are we going to do in and out? And before you know it, you could rack up 200, 300 hits, you know, exposures. Yeah. And you make an excellent point there, Chris, is when you are confined to one or two words, you get real creative about how you're going to use those words and model them. And that's why I think that having a core word of the week or a few words to focus on um, is really great because you start realizing when you have one word or two words to focus on how many different opportunities that come up that you can use it. I have parents that are like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. I used it for this. I used it for that. I used it for this. And they're really excited because they had no idea how many opportunities there actually were to use one word. Yep. Frequency and intensity, absolutely. Choosing this targeted intervention and then really, really actually making sure that it's integrated all throughout the day with all their communication partners. I mean, that's how you get it done. Absolutely. And, um, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to add one more thing. And that's not to say that we only focus on one word, right? We're doing direct teaching of one word and really like kind of targeting our, our, our intention on one word. But when things come up, I'm like, yeah, model that. Or they said something, yeah, expand it. It's not like a hard and fast rule, but it's just a way to give a focus to the, the teaching and the implementation. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 
it goes back to a numbers game to me where if you could, let's say the average school year is 40 weeks long. And so if you did this word words a week, you are, you are intentionally focusing on between 40 and 80 words for the school year. And it's just a way to make sure that you are having that focus. So uh, to me, it makes sense to do it that way. And there's a lot of really great resources out there. Practical AAC does an amazing job with core word of the week. Assistive wear actually has their, um, a lot of really great core word of the week. I mean, there's lots and lots of resources out there um, to help, to help guide you. Right. And that's all about, you know, framing the instructional context, right? Like making sure that the, uh, you know, that their school day is sort of surrounded by supports to, to keep on getting exposure to these words. You know, one thing that um, I really liked, uh, Chris, that you brought up was uh, how to train partners, right? Uh, whether that's peer partners or even siblings or whoever that might be. Um, this is another really big predictor that we know from research in terms of success is the training of the circle of support, right? So here's uh, some other fun tips, right? So for the SLPs out there, one thing that I've done uh, with, with peer groups in the past, and, and I'm, I'm literally talking about, you know, peers drawn from other classes that are going to become conversation partners, is uh, we'll, we'll do silly stuff like, uh, like device pictionary, right? So they'll get a word that they need to describe and they've got to just go in there and keep on hammering away at adjectives and, and nouns. And of course, what they're, what they're trying to actually say will not be in that device. But the idea is to get them really hunting and pecking through there and really learn it. And, um, uh, you know, which, and it's also actually not a bad strategy for increasing um, length of utterance when you're looking at description. Instead of saying the animal, suddenly it can be the green animal, the big green animal, the big green angry animal, the big green any di angry dinosaur. Hey, there's the dinosaur. Look, we got it. <laughs> I'm like the, I'm the, the queen of having two items that are very similar, like two dinosaurs or, you know, you name it. And then I'm like, I'll hold both of them up and they'll be like, dinosaur. And I'm like, which one? They're both dinosaurs. <laughs> you have to use more words. So that's a really great activity too, to start yeah. helping kids specify requests and use those additives and descriptors. Right, right. Which goes back to one of the, the core functions of language, right? Is that um, in many ways, like having a, access to a broad portfolio of vocabulary, and this is a little nerdy, but what it allows you to do is to more specifically identify a single point along a descriptive gradient, right? So, you know, saying animal on the device over and over, you know, as a seven-year-old or whatever might work in that moment because we as adults who are familiar with the child can contextually interpret that. But those same sort of cues don't translate as well when you're a 19 year old in Safeway alone, right? You need to be able to, um, you know, pretty specifically identify what you're talking about to be functional. Um, so I, I have one last thing to just bring up. Uh, to, so everyone, I just have a quick question. Do you think this is stuff we just like made up? Like why should people even listen to us talk about it? Like I know Rachel, I know Chris, I know Lucas, like let's trust them. Like, or is this something that's, I don't know, beyond us. Like where, where do you think all this came from? The good news is, Chris, there's lots of research that we can point to for all of the things that we just said, which hopefully we can include in the show notes so everybody has access to it. Absolutely. Yeah. So we'll make sure that we, we have some citations, um, you know, there on uh, on the show notes. So if you go to tech.speechscience.org, um, you can look at our most recent episode, which will be this one when you're listening to it, very likely. And uh, you can you can access all these resources. So there's a, a ton of a ton of stuff, um, you know, dating even back, uh, you know, into the 70s. But but of course, a lot more recently. Um, about what's being done in core words. And then, you know, we also encourage you to, and, and we will link also to um, some of the resources provided by companies, like we mentioned PRC or Assistive Wear, these other folks. Um, a lot of folks are doing their own, uh, their own research and their own white papers, and um, they're able to share some of that data. Um, but yeah, no, it's not, we're, we're, we're not making it up, right? So, so, so which leads to a bigger question. Does this work? Have you seen it work? I see it work every single day. And it's really exciting, too, for those kids who have a hard time conceptualizing. You know, some, like I said, some kids, they pick this up really quickly. And it's like, core words, I've got it. Other kids, it's not that simple. But the first time that they use a new core word spontaneously, I mean, it's just super exciting. Because it's, it's so awesome. like, it's, it's just, I can't even describe how. I'm, I'm, nobody can see me right now, but I'm smiling so big <laughs> just thinking about these kids that I work with and when they have those breakthroughs, it's just, it's amazing. It's so true. And also the communication partners, right? I mean, when they see that happen, their, their eyes like light up, like, oh, oh, I, I didn't know. I didn't know they could do that. It's like, yeah, I know. Right. And now, you know, and now you can think how much more can they do if we keep using these strategies? So yeah, it's totally uh, exciting for everybody. 
And I think the other thing that we kind of talk about a lot on this podcast, but it's, it's sometimes a long game. It's not something where I introduce it right away and kids totally get it, but just keep at it and stay persistent and presume that kids are capable of doing it and they will rise to the challenge. Right. Right. Like if you're doing a shared book reading exercise, for example, to work on core words, right, which we, you know, I know there's some examples, Rachel, even that we have up of you doing that on video. Um, be prepared to read that book more than once, right? This is something that you're going to do <laughs> yes. a number of times. And uh, that was, that was with my ADD brain, it, it took me a little while to realize, oh, you mean a typically developing child probably asked for the same book 50 <laughs> times. Yeah, okay. This is not unusual. Um, so again, you know, frequency, intensity, um, and, and the training of the, the circle of support are, are big predictors. Um, so building, building that in your schools, building a culture, uh, you know, around, around a partnership and peer communication, um, can be enormous. And there's some great resources out there. We'll also share in the notes. Well, we only have about 20 minutes of the show left, but there's one last thing I want to mention. Um, you know, so like how public radio works, how they do the pledge drive, you know, what, like it seems like every two weeks, but I think it's like every quarter where they try to get you to raise money for the station and in exchange you get mugs and T-shirts and, you know, listening to them for a long time. So we, we really try to keep that to a minimum. However, um, yeah, you know, obviously this is something that costs to run. So what we've done, like a lot of podcasts, is we've turned to a website called Patreon, which uh, does essentially the same thing. Um, so we're able to give uh, rewards, not only physical, but also, uh, you know, sort of in terms of uh, exclusive content um, in exchange for uh, different tiers of contribution. And I, I just want to extend a thank you. I mean, it, 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 really in the last three months, things have really taken off for us there. And um, that said, uh, all of the money that we've made from Patreon in the last three months I uh, just paid about a quarter of our bandwidth uh, cost um, for that same period of time. So, uh, you know, we, we we do have to do a little bit better. You know, I would really appreciate it. We all would really appreciate it. If there's anything at all that you could spare, if you get any value out of the Talking With Tech podcast, um, pop by Patreon, which is P A T. R-E-O-N dot speech science dot org. It'll take you straight there. It'll give you a list of all the different prizes that you can get, anything starting from $1 all the way up to whatever you're willing to contribute. Um, this Patreon now is going exclusively to Talking With Tech, which is great. Um, so we're, we're really able to, to, to turn around that money and, and, and do things like improve our bandwidth, improve our, our audio quality, bring in some, uh, some higher quality guests, uh, and, um, it, just wait till you see how, uh, who we have coming up. We've got, um, some of the consultants, the, the, the person who designed the augmentative communication system for speechless is going to be coming on. Um, we have the incredible Lauren Enders. We have the CEO of the autism society of America. I mean, none of this would be possible without the support of listeners like you. Um, so yes, we are taking a little bit of advertising to offset the cost, but boy, let me tell you, I would prefer if it was all, uh, just, just done by this avenue. So I don't want to embarrass anybody. I'm not going to say any distinctive names, but I do want to, uh, to say a big thank you to Kristen, to Cassandra, to Patrick, to Karen, to Victor, to ooh, another Cassandra, to Susan, Kim, Amanda, uh, another Susan, Daniel, Rachel, um, Meredith, Ariella, uh, yeah, it just keeps going. We've got, um, a good number of people that have contributed anything between, you know, $1 and $50 a month. And, uh, there's no obligation, you know, you can cancel it at any time. Uh, and you get all kinds of fun prizes, uh, mugs, t-shirts. I will record your answering machine when I'm not feeling a little under the weather, and uh, in fact, um, we're going to start doing a monthly closed Q&A uh, for that group. So if you have uh, specific questions you want to ask us, either in terms
terms of assistive technology or augmentative communication or um, whether I'm really this ridiculous uh, in real life. Uh, it's all fair game. Um, so again, patreon.speechscience.org. Take a look and uh, we'll keep you all posted in terms of what the plans are. Thanks again. We really appreciate you listening, no matter whether or not you contribute. And stay tuned for the last uh, 15, 20 minutes of the episode. Another thing that I want to mention is, so if you go on my Instagram, which is Rachel Madel SLP, I actually have a series of core word pictures. And it's really exciting because I kind of have a picture like dinosaurs. I keep talking about dinosaurs. I I hardly ever use dinosaurs in my therapy, but to me, I get it. (laughs) I'm speaking to sixth grade Lucas. Yep. Um, but yeah, so anyway, if you go on there, it's really cool because I have a few core words to get people started. And then I always ask, you know, what are the core words you're using for this specific activity or what are your favorite core words? And people always think of things that I never thought of. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you're so right. So it's just, it's really interesting that, you know, we can have these activities and we can all collaborate with one another and think of things that, yeah. you know, I, I didn't think of. Right. Ask the, ask the school team what they see, right. And what, what they feel like are like, when, when are they seeing, um, you know, meltdowns or, or, or breakdowns in communication, right? Very often there's a word that's missing right at the core of that, you know, um, exactly. although we have some, some research, research that maybe can, can contradicts that, but um, the, so, so that's one big way. Um, you know, one, one other thing that I do, and this is somewhat going back to the fringe piece, but I often, you know, you know, and I'm thinking a little bit about private practice here, but I'll ask folks um, for an interest inventory, um, you know, for their kids so that I'll know ahead of time what's motivating. But that, that can be challenging too. So if we could, let's take a moment. Let's, let's throw some wrenches into this. Let's see, what, what, what do you do when, when a few things go wrong? So what if you have that fringe page of preferred snacks or whatever it might be, and, and the student, no matter what you do, is just navigating straight to that and wailing on a choice, and they're not wanting to, you know, attend to the device where you're modeling. What, what do you do? Um, I have a very specific thing that I do with that exact situation. Um, typically the kids that I'm working with, they're motivated by food and toys. So we can work on eat and play. And if they're going, you know, to say pretzel, 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 I'll hold up a pretzel and something that you could like a toy uh, like a book and say, do you want to eat and kind of wave the pretzel in front of them? Or do you want to play and wave the, the toy in front of them and then model it and just say, oh, you want to eat? And the nice thing is, once kids realize it's quicker, it's like, look, all you have to do is say eat. You just have to say eat. You don't have to go navigate all these like folders. Just say eat. And usually if you have it quick enough, they start picking it up. And they're like, oh, cool. All I have to do is say eat. And eventually it will stick. Yeah, great. What about, okay, I'm going to throw you another wrench. Here's another wrench. What, what about, I'm ready um, to catch it. <laughs> yeah, all right. What about a student with a complex motor profile, right? Where, where rate enhancement or speed of access is a really big deal. How do you feel about um, providing, say, uh, you know, a nine year old uh, student with Rett syndrome on a, with a new eye device, gaze device? Should we be exclusively using core or should we have quick fire phrases, for example, that then would be modeling language back to them that they can select? I, yes, I think that we need to balance it all. We obviously want to teach kids how to build language, um, you know, generatively. So we don't only want phrases where they just kind of hit a button because we might not know what they want to say. So we have to kind of simultaneously teach those skills. But as far as quick access to things that children need right away, I'm a big believer in those quick fire phrases, um, especially in a social context, because peers don't have patience to wait for a child to create a sentence like, you know, do you want to play? But if we can have that easy access, they can just hit the button. It's just, it's a lot better for social situations, I find. You know, I think this might be one of those places where not everyone has one primary mode of communication. Right now I'm nodding. Uh, Right now you're nodding that you understand me. We're all nodding. (laughs) And I I wonder if that's not the case where you have um, a a device or you have multiple actual devices. What I mean by that is uh, when I say device, it could be like a low-tech 
portion as well. So uh, I could picture some sort of ancillary system that goes along with the primary system that uh, students could be learning to use those sort of phrases. Like here are my 10 phrases that I like to say all the time and they're uh, around the, 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 the fringe of, of my device or something like that. Right, right. Well, and it, like you made the comment earlier of, um, you know, it's, it's fine to introduce fringe at the same time as core, right? Just it, maybe not at the expense of core. Maybe it's fine also to have these quick fire phrases. Um, you know, my, my preference as a clinician is to be able to introduce those once I know that the student has created them generatively with the device and so yes. the understands the structure. Um, you know, that's not always possible, right? Like maybe the Rett syndrome uh, example is a little bit extreme. Um, but one thing I will say to clinicians out there is that that shouldn't be all that's there, right? We, we, need, to have, we need to have the access to that robust core vocabulary. Um, but we, you know, we also need to make sure the device is, is motivating and useful and, you know, functional and that they're going to keep on using it or else they're just going to stare away from that eye gaze and um, not attend to it. Um, all right, I, I see that that's a little bit tougher. I, I, we want to hear your feedback, so please shoot us an email, tech at speechscience.org. Um, you can also go to tech.speechscience.org and uh, give us feedback right there on the, um, the site. Um, also, please join us at Facebook. We've got a, a pretty big, cool group of uh, really engaged people. We'd love to answer questions there. Um, we got some, some wonderful feedback even overnight that I was kind of kind of glowing about, and then occasionally we get challenging feedback, which is even better. That's great. We like to grow. Um, but I guess a final wrench here is um, what about we've been addressing one population here, right? Which is the, you know, school age entry level almost. Um, how, how would this be different? Um, you know, for, for, do we have a different core word vocabulary for adults, for example? No, I think that's part of the research that we'll link into the show notes is that the core vocabulary is uh, universal, right? So it's from toddler age to geriatric age. It's, it's the same. So uh, the words don't change no matter how old you are. Yep. Yep. That's exactly what the research tells us. So that's, that's perfect. Thank you for, for biting my, my lead there. I appreciate it. And, and fringe could change, right? I mean, there's usually, there's like three, like fringe, fringe is context dependent, where as opposed to core, like Rachel said earlier, where it can be useful all throughout the day in different contexts. Fringe is often drawn from like one of three domains, right? Which is either interests, uh, you know, personal circumstance, like parent names, uh, addresses, things like that, or academics, you know, um, so it'll be pulled in from whatever unit maybe is, is happening instructionally. Um, and that's going to change a lot when you, you suddenly have, you know, maybe, uh, maybe when I'm talking about a 70 year old with aphasia that's going into Starbucks, right? That's a different, um, I don't, I don't know if mocha whip is, needs to be on the French vocabulary. Of every no, dark drink, dark drink. Hey, there we go. <laughs> dark drink. Love white, it. Top. white on top. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have um, an episode where we only can talk in core words. <laughs> well, sometime. Um, what about, um, we, now, so when students are in that sort of middling phase, right? So we, we often get asked about the sort of two word hump um, or things like that, where you're at the I want or, you know, I go um, sort of piece. Do, what is the value of modeling and recasting, do you think? Um, of taking that sentence and then producing like a, a lengthened utterance to sort of demonstrate. I do it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, meaning uh, when I often think when I'm explaining to communication partners about language development, I express it as a staircase, draw a little stair. And I say, okay, the student's probably on this step on the staircase. So we're going to model right here, one step above. You can't see my fingers, everybody, but I'm one step above on my fictional little staircase that I'm drawing in the air here. Um, and I say, so that what that means is uh, I might model what they say and then add uh, one word or two words. So if uh, if the kid were to say open, I might say I open or you open or something like that. You know, uh, if we're watching the Olympics and the kids going fast up and down the uh, the slopes. Well, I guess down the slopes. You don't go up fast up the slope, but you go down the slopes fast. I might be like down fast if the kid said fast. You know that kind of thing. Great, that's perfect. I, that, and it's fun because then you get to watch the Olympics, right? I mean, that's <laughs> ideal. Although I'm, I'm I'm a little over it now. I have to admit, there's been a lot of Olympics. Um, well, this has been a great conversation, guys. Thanks so much. Uh, as, as always, we want to hear your feedback. I know I just said it, but tech at speechscience.org. Um, you can reach us with any questions or on Facebook or at tech.speechscience.org. We also would love feedback in the form of a review. So if you have time, please do take a moment to, uh, to review us on iTunes, to subscribe, um, share with any of your friends that are out there. Uh, we want to um, make sure that we get uh, as much feedback as we can so we can continue giving you what's actually needed instead of what we want to talk about, right? So just, just like the AAC argument you have to you have to program us you you give us the the vocab and we'll talk about it um 
But once again, for Speech Science, my name is Luke Stuber, joined today by Rachel Madel and Chris Begay. We'll talk to you next week. <laughs>